In the previous talks, you've heard about what Parliament does, how it holds government to account, and how that accountability feels from the point of view of government. In this last talk, I want to ask a fundamental question about who controls Parliament itself. I suggest that there are three ways um, in which we, <clears throat> the, there are three ways in which we might ask who controls Parliament, each of which I'll speak about in turn. The first is something we've touched upon before, so I'll be very brief, regarding the power relationship between the two chambers of Parliament, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. The second is about the different groupings inside the chambers of Parliament, which Paul touched on in his talk. In particular, how powerful are the political parties in deciding what happens? The third and biggest question, which we'll spend a bit more time talking about, is the control that government has over what, par what Parliament actually does particularly its power over the House of Commons. So starting with, the, um, starting with the power relationship between the two chambers, I spoke about this in my talk to the last meeting of the Assembly, indicating that while we've got two chambers, the House of Commons is very much on top. This was emphasized in both Paul and Farrer's presentations today. Only the House of Commons confidence is required for the government to remain in office, and only its approval is necessary for most bills to become acts of parliament. This reflects the makeup of the two chambers. Because the House of Commons is elected by the public, it's respected as the chamber which should have the final say. The House of Lords can make suggestions and ask the House of Commons to think again, but usually the Commons will make the final decision. Turning to who has power within the chambers, it's impossible to understand the dynamics in Parliament properly without considering the role of political parties. Nearly all MPs are elected to represent one political party or another, and most members of the Lords also belong to parties, although it has a lot of independent members as well. Paul explained how each party has a front bench and a back bench. In the governing party, the front bench comprises ministers, while in opposition, in, in opposition parties, front benches are shadow ministers who similarly focus on the work of one particular government department, such as education or health. Within the two biggest parties, Labour and the Conservatives, a minority of MPs are front benches, while the majority are backbenchers. Backbenchers are relatively more free in what they can say and do, and will sometimes speak out against their parties if they think front benches are getting it wrong. This is an important part of parliamentary scrutiny and accountability. However, many of you will have heard of the whips who try and keep members of the party working and voting together. In particular, if too many backbenchers from the governing party vote against the government, it won't be able to get its business through parliament. So the parties work hard to try and remain united and to speak with one voice. Whips seek to persuade backbenchers to support the frontbench position, but their role in controlling or bullying members is often exaggerated. The relationship actually goes both ways. Whips also listen carefully to what backbenchers say and feed their concerns to frontbenchers. So the party remains united because frontbenchers have listened to what backbenchers have to say, as well as the other way around. Backbenchers do sometimes break with the, with the party and vote independently, but usually they'll air their concerns behind the scenes rather than in public, and the party will vote together. That's why, as we've already said, a government with a House of Commons majority will usually be able to get its business through. Because the government doesn't have a majority in the House of Lords, it's more likely to be defeated there. But MPs, of course, can reject the Lords suggestions if they want to. The final crucial question is the extent to which government, which government directly controls what Parliament does. This goes beyond ministers proposing policy to Parliament and encouraging their members to vote for it. There are actually key ways in which ministers control the working of parliament itself, and I'll briefly point to four. The first relates to the House of Lords, and we've already discussed this a bit. I won't dwell on it, but we might return to it in a future weekend. This is that the Prime Minister can appoint members of the House of Lords, and there are very few controls on his ability to do so. This means the government ultimately controls both the size and the party balance in the Lords which is quite unusual and quite controversial. The other forms of government control relate to the House of Commons and have all been subject to quite lively arguments in recent years. First, the rules of the House of Commons give a lot of priority to the government in terms of deciding what gets discussed. 
there's a figure called the leader of the House of Commons, who's a government minister, and he draws up the agenda for the Commons week ahead. This is announced to MPs, but although the leader of the House of Commons may listen to their views, MPs can't amend the agenda. So ministers decide the weekly timetable and the topics for most debates. There is regular time set aside for other things, such as questions to the government, which Farah and Jill discussed, and occasional debates sponsored by the opposition. There's also some time set aside for bills from backbench MPs. But generally, it's difficult for MPs to get time for Parliament to debate and decide matters that the government doesn't want to discuss. In some other parliaments, including the Scottish Parliament, there's a cross-party committee which makes these kind of decisions instead. The second area where the government has quite a lot of control of the House of Commons relates to when it sits. It's the government, not MPs, that proposes the dates when the Commons takes breaks from sitting, for example, for Christmas, Easter and over the summer. Many of you will remember the controversy a couple of years ago when the government sought to prorogue Parliament, which is another kind of stopping parliamentary business. And that ended up with an argument in the courts. There's a flip side to decisions about stopping Parliament sitting, which is what if something happens during a parliamentary break that MPs want to gather to discuss? Under current arrangements, they rely on government to trigger a so-called recall of Parliament, as they don't have the power to do this themselves. Last, I can get back to my slide. Lastly, there's a debate going on about who should control the timing of general elections. In the UK, we have a general election at least every five years. The question is whether it should be possible for the prime minister to trigger an early general election on their own, which formally requires asking the queen to call the election, but she has little ability to refuse, or whether the prime minister's proposal should require the approval of the House of Commons. The power used to lie with the prime minister alone, and this was changed to introduce a degree of parliamentary control. But the question now is whether it should be changed back. On all of these points, there are arguments in favour of the government. Sorry. There are arguments in favour of the government having control over the House of Commons, but also arguments that the House of Commons should have this control instead. And we're going to return to these kinds of questions in our afternoon sessions. So back to Kayla. <laughs>